Hello and welcome to Sunday School Lesson number 46. The topic today is Suicide is Forbidden. Suicide is Forbidden. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you today. We ask, O oh Lord, that you will help us to examine this very sensitive topic to try to unravel what push people to suicide and what are the ways or what are the antidotes to getting out of such suicide or such thoughts and harmful actions. Father Lord, we pray that you will help us, O oh Lord, to see that ray of light, that light that you shed that will brighten all our dark corners. Father, help us today, O oh Lord, even as to as we come to terms with this very present danger that's common in our midst. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen. Suicide is forbidden. You'll be wondering what kind of topic is that in Sunday school. The reality is that suicide is getting increasingly common. We hear news of it on a daily basis. Research has shown that about 90% of people who attempt or those who actually succeed in committing suicide have one form of mental illness or the other. When people feel that they've been pushed to the wall, they don't see a way out, they feel lonely, rejected, dejected, they feel like they, 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 they failed in everything and they don't see a way out. They believe that the only way is for them to take themselves out of the equation. We're going to show through this lesson in a very empathetic way that suicide is not the solution. There's always a way out, no matter how hard times may be, no matter how lonely the road may get, no matter how hopeless the, the, the situation may seem, there's always an alternative to suicide. May God help us as we examine this in Jesus' name. Remember we said most of it is due to some mental illness, so we need to be empathetic. If the people who commit suicide, if they knew better, if they could help themselves, they probably wouldn't have chosen that route. So let's try to understand what's behind it, what causes that kind of stress, what causes that kind of hopelessness that will make people take that drastic action. Um, it could be even financial loss. They could, maybe they invested in something and everything came crashing down or they lost a job and they don't see a way out. All kinds of people things could trigger people. We're not saying that everybody reacts the same way, but some people just don't have that capacity to cope with that kind of stressful situation, that kind of imbalance in their lives. Our text today is taken from Romans 5 verses 1 to 8. Romans 5 verses 1 to 8. It says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have access by faith into his grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. Now hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, but perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. If we look at our situation as sinners, without Christ, it was a hopeless situation. We were doomed from death, because it says, the Bible says the wages of sin is death. But Christ himself gave us hope by dying for us. And that hope is what we need to keep alive, no matter what we are going through. It says when we go through tribulations, the grace of God gives us perseverance. We're able to persevere. We're going to endure that tribulation. And as we endure, our character is built up. And as our character is built up, we see hope. We receive hope to wade through that storm and come out stronger. I pray that all of us will receive that strength, that hope that Christ alone offers. Our memory verse is taken from 1 Peter 5, 7. 1 Peter 5, 7. In the King James Version, it says, Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. New Living Translation says, Give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares for you. The truth is that a child of God is never alone. You may not have human beings around you. You may not have friends or relatives to lean on. 
but God is always there. You're never alone. So if everything else fails, you have a friend in Jesus and you can pour out your heart to him. Just cast your worries and your cares to God. Report those cares and worries to God because he cares and he will see you through. And I pray that as many as are going through that difficult moment, that hopeless moment, they will see, they will perceive that Christ cares for them and that Christ himself gives them hope and grace to endure that persecution, that tribulation, that hardship in the mighty name of Jesus. Our outline, we have two outlines today. The first one talks about the biblical view of suicide. And the second one talks about antidotes to such suicidal thoughts and attempts. Remember we said it's usually some mental disturbance that leads people to actually carry out suicide. So where, what does the Bible say about suicide? Number one, suicide is murder, self-murder. And going strictly by the word of God, Exodus 20 verse 13, Exodus 20 verse 13 says, Thou shalt not kill. In a more modern translation, it says, You shall not murder. So suicide is self-murder. Anyone who commits suicide has actually committed murder. So it's a sin against God. But someone who is disturbed does not really see that, that he's committing a sin against God. Secondly, it's God who creates us. He's, it is God who gives us life. He's the owner, he's the author of life. And no one has the right to take that life. No one has the right to take that life because God is the one who gives life. God is the one who takes away life. We should not, human beings, step into that arena and try to take life. Job 1 verse 21 says, And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. It is the Lord who gives us life. And it is the Lord who should decide when he is going to take it away. When he is going to call someone. When someone is going to leave this world. We shouldn't take that decision for ourselves. Praise the Lord. There are some examples of people in the Bible who actually committed suicide. So suicide is not new in our modern day life. Yes, the stresses in this time, you know, there are, there are many. But even back then, people thought they had reason and some actually committed suicide. The first example is a man called Abimelech. Abimelech. He was in a, he was in a battle with his people, you know, people, his father's, uh, Gideon, some of his father's uh, people came against him and they wanted to kill him. And he was standing beneath a, a tower and a woman was going to throw a mortar down from the tower to crush his head. And he said, rather than people saying a woman killed him, he called his sword man and said, please, I'm a bearer, please draw your sword and kill me. So he preferred to die because he encouraged someone else to kill him rather than have the story told that he was killed by a woman. In Judges 9.54, Judges 9.54, then he, that's Abimelech, then he called quickly to the young man, his armor bearer, and said to him, Draw your sword and kill me, lest men say of me a woman killed him. So this young man thrust him through and he died. So that was Abimelech. He faced certain death and the, he felt it was going to be too humiliating for people to say that he was killed by a woman. So he asked his sword man, his armor bearer, to kill him. The same thing with King Saul. King Saul also committed suicide. When the Philistines has, had drawn upon him and they had wounded him mortally, Saul said to his armor bearer, let's read uh, 1 Samuel 31 verse 4. 1 Samuel 31 verse 4. Then Saul said to his armor bearer, draw, draw your sword and thrust me through with it. Lest these uncircumcised men come and thrust me through and abuse me. But his armor bearer would not, but was greatly afraid. Therefore Saul took a sword and fell on it himself. He had been wounded by the arrow of the Philistines and he knew that that was a mortal wound. But he didn't want the Philistines to have the final say or the, the, the satisfaction of saying they killed Saul. So he wanted to finish the job himself. He asked his armor bearer, maybe a young man, to finish the job for him. But the man was too afraid. So Saul fell on his own sword. He committed suicide. 
Similarly, his armor bearer too, seeing that his master was dead, committed suicide. In 1 Samuel 31 verse 5, 1 Samuel 31 verse 5, when his armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he also fell on his own sword and died with him. So Abimelech, Saul, Saul's armor bearer. Then Ahithophel, remember that wise counselor? They said when he gave counsel, it was as if God himself was speaking. And as soon as he saw that Absalom, David's rebellious son, was not going to take his counsel, he knew, he knew that his days were numbered. So in 2 Samuel 17, 23, 2 Samuel 17, 17, 23, said, now when Ahithophel saw that his advice was not followed, he saddled a donkey and arose and went home to his house, to his city. Then he put his household in order and hanged himself and died. And he was buried in his father's tomb. So if you read all these stories, they knew that death was certain. And they, did, they wanted to control the narrative of how they died. So they chose suicide. There's another man in the Bible, Zimri. There was also conflict about the throne. And he saw that the city, the, the people were coming around and they were going to kill him. So in 1 Kings 16 verse 18, 1 Kings 16 verse 18, then it happened when Zimri saw that the city was taken, that he was that he went to the citadel of the king's house and burned the king's house down upon himself with fire and died. Another king had anointed himself and they were going to come and take Zimri, who was the substantive king. They were going to take him and kill him. So he decided to burn the house down with himself and he died in that fire. And finally, New Testament example, Judas. Judas Iscariot who betrayed Jesus Christ. Matthew 27 verse 5 says, Then he threw down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. So these are examples in the Bible that people committed suicide when they saw a hopeless situation around them. And that really is the case in the modern times. People see hopelessness and they think that the only way out is to commit suicide. Now, every single one of these instances contravened God's law that says, Thou shalt not kill. That means, Thou shalt not kill thyself. You shall not kill another human being, and you shall not kill yourself. So, they contravened God's uh, instruction, that's God's commandment that said, Thou shalt not kill. Now, we've seen examples of people who actually committed suicide. There are also examples in the Bible of people who were near suicide. But thankfully, they didn't go through with it. Solomon, King Solomon, the wise king, was one of such. In Ecclesiastes 2.17, Ecclesiastes 2.17, said, Therefore I hated life because of the work that was, that was done under the sun was distressing to me, for all his vanity and grasping at the wind. He hated life. He summed everything up and said, This is not worth it. This is not worth it. Many people are like that. When they look around and say, It's not worth it. So Solomon was near that point, was near suicidal. Also, Elijah, the great prophet, who had called down fire and you know, destroyed so many all the prophets of Baal, well, at a particular time, he felt his life was under threat and he felt everything was lost, all hope was lost. In 1 Kings 19 verse 4, 1 Kings 19 verse 4, For he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he prayed that he might die and said, It is enough. Now, Lord, take my life. I am no better than my father's. Elijah was fed up. Solomon hated his life. He was ready to go. Elijah too was fed up. He was ready for God to take his life. Another example, Solomon, um, Jonah. Jonah, God sent him to Nineveh. He tried to dodge. God caused a storm that almost capsized the boat that he was in they threw him in and the ship uh, a fish swallowed him and then vomited him on the shore so that he could resume the journey he eventually went to Nineveh God pronounced judgment he went there and delivered the message and they all repented and then Jonah was angry that God was going to forgive them so he said he wanted to die in Jonah 4 verse 8 Jonah 4 verse 6 and it happened when the sun arose that God had prepared a vehement east wind and the sun beat on Jonah's head so that he grew faint then he wished death for himself. I said, it is better for me to die than to live. Because God was trying to teach him a lesson. Jonah had compassion for, you know, the, 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 there was a plant that God had allowed to grow to provide shade for him. And then when a worm ate that plant, Jonah was angry with God. And he wanted to die. 
So Jonah too was close to die. What about Apostle Paul? He too was near that point several times. In 2 Corinthians 1, 8-10, 2 Corinthians 1, 8-10, it says, For we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble, which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond measure, even above strength, so that we despaired even of life. Yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a death, and does deliver us, in whom we trust that he will still deliver us. So these men too in the Bible thought about suicide. They were, they, they were near that hopeless end point. Solomon, Elijah, Jonah, and Apostle Paul. But guess what? God intervened. They, through the help of the Holy Spirit, they were able to get themselves out. The word of God sank into them and they came up, came away from that edge of despair. Let's see what Solomon said when he had gathered his thoughts together and he was no longer thinking of death. In Ecclesiastes 12, 13 says, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. Solomon recovered. That hopelessness was no longer there. The same thing with Elijah. God sent an angel to him when he thought, Oh, it's better for me to die. God sent an angel to him in 1 Kings 19 verse 5. 1 Kings 19 verse 5. Then he, as he lay and slept under a broom tree, suddenly an angel touched him and said, said to him, Arise and eat. God provided food for him. God nourished him. In verse 15 of that same 1 Kings verse 15, later God revealed the future plans to him. In 1 Kings 19 15, then the Lord said to him, Go. Return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you arrive, anoint Hazel as king over Assyria. And the subsequent verses, he gave him also instructions on who to anoint uh, you know, over other places, including who would be his own successor. Imagine if God had listened to Elijah when he said, oh, I want to die. He would not have been able to fulfill the remaining part of his life. So my brothers and my, and my sisters, they are hopeless feeling. Don't let it linger. God still has a plan for you. Listen to his voice. Let him bring you out of that dark place into the place of light so that you can continue and fulfill your destiny. The same thing with Jonah. You remember, you know, we said Jonah was angry at God, angry that God was compassionate to the people of Nineveh, angry that God actually uh, allowed a plan that was providing shade for him to, to die. Jonah 4, 1 to 3 says, But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. So he prayed to the Lord, Ah, Lord, was this not what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore I fled previously to Tarshish. For I know that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger, and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Can you imagine? Some of us are so vindictive. When something, someone does something bad or something is going wrong in our society, we want them, those people to be punished. We want them to suffer. But our God is a merciful God. If he decides to show mercy to them, we shouldn't be angry. He said, I will be merciful to whom I will be merciful. I will show compassion to whom I will show compassion. Don't let your mind be disturbed because God didn't punish the wicked the way you wanted him to punish the wicked. He's just showing mercy. In Jonah 4 verse 11, God told Jonah, said, Should I not pity Nineveh, that great city, in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right and their left, and much livestock? God was, you know, explaining to, to, to Jonah why he had to take the action, why he had to show compassion. So don't allow frustration about the evil around you, about the fact that the wicked seems to be prospering. Don't allow that frustration to drive you to suicide or to suicidal thoughts. And as for Paul, Paul learns how to depend on God. In 2 Corinthians 1, 9-10, 2 Corinthians 1, 9-10, so yes, we have the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a death, and does deliver us, in whom we trust, and he will still deliver us. Paul quickly realized that it was God who delivered him from the death, from the thought of death, and the even the physical attempts you know, people on his life, and God continues to deliver us and he will deliver us in future so that is really 
what the message is. Don't despair. It is not over. Even when the thought comes, banish the thought. Allow the light of God, allow the word of God to sink deep down and bring you out. He brought Solomon out of that depression, out of those dark thoughts of wanting to die. He brought Elijah out. He brought Jonah out of that thought of wanting to die. Even Apostle Paul, God brought him out and showed him that the Lord was still on his side. He was still compassionate and giving him great deliverances. God has not forgotten you. When you talk to him, he will answer you. He has not, you are not alone. That is one thing you need to do. Don't, don't, you need to believe. Don't believe that, oh, because things are not going well, you're alone in the world. No, you're not alone. My brothers and my sisters, you're not alone in the world. We'll now go to the second outline, which is the antidote to suicidal thoughts and attempts. How can we get rid of, how can we solve that problem of suicidal thoughts or suicidal suicide attempts? Number one, allow God to demonstrate to you that he loves you. God loves you and he's trying to get, make an inroad into your heart. Open your heart to him. Let him demonstrate his love towards you. Romans 5 verse 5 says, Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Allow that love to flow through you. Allow the realization that God really and truly loves you. The psalmist says, When my mother and my father forsake me, even then the Lord is with me. If everyone else around you has deserted you, God has not deserted you. So allow that love to flow to you. Let God prove to you that he loves you. In the first place, he loves you. Even while you were still a sinner, God had made a plan for your salvation. That's why, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish. God doesn't want you to perish. God wants you to have eternal life. But if you kill yourself, you have broken God's commandment. You have broken the commandment. So remove suicide from the table. Allow the love of God to wash over you. So remember that God is with you. He identifies with you in the time of trouble because he has been through it. He is a, he, he, he has he was he came in flesh and he experienced most of the emotions that we are experiencing. In Isaiah 53, 2 to 6, Isaiah 53, 2 to 6. It says, for he shall grow before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form of comeliness when we see him. There's no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And we hid as his way our faces from him. He was despised. We did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we were healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Everything you are going through, God has experienced. Jesus has experienced it. He, he, he has compassion. He empathizes with you because he too has been there. So just Allow yourself to remember that God has gone before you. He identifies with you in your suffering. He identifies with you in that loneliness. Betrayal. God was, Jesus was betrayed. They spat on him. They accused him wrongly. He was lonely. He was forsaken. Even his disciples forsook him after he was arrested in the, in the Garden of Eden. One of those closest to him, one of the closest disciples, betrayed him. So whatever it is that is happening in your life, know that our Lord Jesus Christ has also experienced it before now. And you can draw on his strength. And remember that because Jesus suffered and died, he has removed your guilt and the weight of sin. You don't have to bear the weight of sin anymore. Even if you have sinned in the past, it's come, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they will be as white as snow. What have you done? Go to Jesus. He will forgive you. He will give you a clean slate. Romans 5, 7 to 8 says, For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrated his own love towards us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Even before we came to know him, he had made provision for our salvation. Romans 8, 32 says, He who did not spare his own son, that's talking about God, he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? 
What's that thing that you lack? God gave his only begotten son. He's turned his face away temporarily from his own son. He will give you that which you need. He will send help to you. He will bring you back from that brink of suicide and despair in the mighty name of Jesus. So what do you need to do? Believe and be assured that Jesus will forgive you of whatever sin you may have committed and he will repair everything that's broken in your life and he will restore your joy. Jesus will do that for you. Isaiah 1 verse 8 says, So the daughter of Zion is let, left as a boat of the variant, as a hut in a garden of cucumbers, as a besieged city. Verse 18 says, Come, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. That's Isaiah 1 18. Come. Whatever it is, the blood of Jesus will erase it, will wipe it away, and give you a clean slate. 2 Corinthians 5 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. God will make you new. He will give you a new story. He will erase your past, your hurts, your pains, your sins, even the bad behaviors. He will forget them. He will wipe them away and give you a new lease of life. Just trust him to do that. Review your hope. Know that God will definitely rescue you if you trust in him. He will rescue you. If you cry unto him, he will rescue you. Psalm 61 verses 1 to 2. Psalm 61 verses 1 to 2. Hear my cry, O God. Attend to my prayer. From the end of the earth, I will cry to you when my heart is overwhelmed. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. That is the crux of this message. When you are overwhelmed, when your heart is full, you cannot take anything more anymore. Cry to God. Ask him to help you. Now says, this poor man cried and the Lord delivered him. When there's no one else to go to, nowhere else to turn to, everything seems to be as a standstill, stalemate. Cry to the Lord. When your heart cannot take any more pain, they ask him to lead you to a higher plane. And that rock that is higher than you is Jesus Christ. And he hears prayers. When we cry to him with all our heart, he answers us. Jeremiah 33 verse 3 says, Call to me and I will answer you and will show you great and mighty things which you do not know. My brother, my sister, you are not at the end. It's not yet over. It's bad, but it's not yet over. There's still one more place to look. Look up. Look up to Jesus. Call on to him and he will answer you and he will deliver you and he will give you a fresh vision. Just like he gave Elijah a fresh vision and fresh look into his destiny fresh instructions you will receive fresh instructions you will be restored and hope will be renewed in you in the mighty name of jesus learn to trust god with your life no matter what's going on no job no money no husband no wife say my times are in your hand you've faced rejection all over the place just say my times are in your hand psalm 31 verse 15 says my times are in your hand Deliver me from the hand of my enemies and those who persecute you. So the lesson here is that shun suicidal thoughts. Don't even attempt suicide. God is there. His love is constant. His love, a mother cannot forget her child. So God cannot forget you. He says you are engraved in the palm of his hand. If all else, if everyone else forsakes you, God has not forsaken you. He is there for you. Cry unto him. Surrender your life to him. Tell him your time are in his hand. Let him lead you out of that despair, out of that dark thought, to a place of light and hope. I pray that God will help us all and we will not disobey God by attempting suicide or committing suicide in the name of Jesus. He has given us life and that life is abundant. That life is a life of hope, eternal life that we should not terminate with suicide. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this word. We pray that this word will minister to someone today and they will abandon that thought of suicide, that attempt, that, that hopelessness, Lord. You will give them hope instead of hopelessness. You will give them that something to look forward to. They will look up to you and they will hear your voice. They will know that you love them and their joy will be renewed. Thank you, Lord, for answering our prayers. In Jesus' mighty name, we are prayed.
Amen.